Hello, everyone, and welcome to Channel 781 News. Uh, this week, we're going to be uh, reflecting on our first half of our first year covering the city council. Uh, so as you can see, instead of doing it all on Zoom, we're here in person in Ward 7 uh, together for the first time. I'm Josh Kastorf, and I'm here with Christine Mackin. Hello, everybody. Who has been our policy expert on some of our shows, so she's here to help us uh, debrief. Um, and of course, James Crickelly's and Chris Gamble. Hello. And so I'm going to turn it over to Chris to lead our um, discussion. But first, I wanted to talk about community events. Um, so there was uh, fireworks this past weekend. The event um, in Prospect Hill Park got canceled um, due to rain, uh, but the fireworks still happen. We, there aren't any um, one-off events coming up in July. However, the Farmer's Market is ongoing. The Waltham Arts Council Summer Concert Series is ongoing. Free Zumba in the Common is ongoing. That's Wednesdays at 7 p.m. That is um, Jen Zumbera and sometimes I think Ann Callahan helps her. Those are the two ladies who got everybody moving at Pride from like zero to 60. It was really amazing. So if you like that energy, you should check out Free Zumba in the Common. Um, and the city council is not meeting again until August 1st. Um, on July 11th, there's a special meeting of the Rules and Ordinances Committee um, where they're going to tell us something uh, about the cannabis shops. And um, in that August 1st meeting, as we've mentioned, the Waltham Historic Commission is gonna be there to discuss the fernal. So that's an important one. I wanted to know both Chris and I have our Kennedy Middle School GSC Pride t-shirts, which we're very proud of. Shout out to Kennedy Middle School, um, GSA, sorry, I should say GSA. Um, they made these shirts not to raise money for themselves, but for um, the House for Little Wanderers and Little Queer Library. So shout out to them. We're really happy to have the shirts. So that being said, Chris, do you want to um, start us off on reflecting on uh, City Council so far this year? Absolutely. Um, two events uh, that I want to plug as well. Concerts on the Commons start this week. And the first one is scheduled for today, which is Tuesday, um, but it was canceled because of the rain. So as long as we get this out on Wednesday, uh, it's rescheduled to Thursday. Concerts on the Commons is nice. Um, they do one a month um, at the gazebo, and it's a very big thing. Everyone comes out. Um, so the first one of the season is going to be this Thursday. I forget the time. You can look it up um, on the city's website. Uh, it's a nice thing. And then also the Waltham Fields Community Farm, their uh, July Crop Mob is July 23rd, which is a Saturday at 9 a.m., which is a cool thing. Usually you have to like um, register to volunteer at the farm, uh, but the Crop Mob is just an open invitation to come anytime between 9 and 12, and I believe it's uh, de weeding um, the farm, but uh, it could be anything. Um, and it's a nice uh, occasion as well. But uh, moving on to city council reflections. Also, I want to acknowledge that uh, uh, we did talk about it last week, but uh, congratulations to us for succeeding in debriefing for an entire session. No one has ever done that before, and uh, it's a cool thing that we did. Um, so I guess I'll open up the floor if anyone has any highs or lows of the season that they want to talk about. Um, now is a good time to talk. Well, I have one thing that was kind of a high and a low, the same issue basically, which mm -hmm. was the issue of getting all the meetings mm -hmm. recorded and captioning. So this was something I got involved with in 2020, in fall of 2020 was when they stopped, started doing the meetings in person again, and which meant they weren't recording all of them and the, the recordings that are online don't have captions. Um, so I say it was kind of a high because I, I, I connected with some other people who were concerned about this. We wrote to the city council. Um, Councilor LaCava got back to us and sort of took it up as something that he was gonna work on. Uh, Councilor Paz and Councilor Darcy were also very supportive of it. It took a very long time uh, because mostly because they were waiting for information from WCAC. Um, but it looks like it's now happening. Uh, there turned out there was a pot of money that the mayor had that she's now made available to the city council and WCAC to use for this. And there was a job ad placed for camera people. So for the first time getting involved in trying to make something happen in the city council, that was pretty good results. So I was pretty happy about it. 
The downside of it is it hasn't been implemented yet. We still haven't seen those meetings recorded. And so hopefully that's happening in the fall um, when they come back to regular meetings, but we'll see. Um, the person who is in charge of implementing it now is the director of WCAC, as far as I understand. And she was someone who said in these meetings, she really didn't want to do it. She didn't think it was important or necessary. So it still remains to be seen how it's implemented. Um, maybe it's that they haven't been able to find camera people yet, and that's the only reason, which is understandable because it's really hard to hire people now, but we'll see if there are other things. The other thing that was a low point was when we found out because of Chris's um, complaint that there, the committees of the city council can and do have meetings that aren't on Tuesday nights that are at other times. And although they may announce those online, they're only required to announce them on the bulletin board. So what that means was when we said to the city council, can you record all the meetings? And they said, yes, we'll record all the Tuesday night meetings. That actually wasn't the same thing. We, there is, we don't know how often they do this, but they have a way of doing meetings that will still be unrecorded even once this is implemented. Mm -hmm. Um, Can so I jump in. Go on ahead. That? Actually, go ahead. Yeah, I agree with you that that was a low. And one of the things that really irritated me about that was the display of smug satisfaction from some of the city councilors that they had complied with the letter of the state open meeting law. And um, what I would like to see some councilors do is use this as an opportunity to opt into a system that is um, acceptable under the state open meeting law, where Waltham will affirmatively make a choice to say that we are a community that is going to post every meeting online. Uh, we're going to notice every meeting online. Um, and every cycle counselors run on transparency. Transparency, And this is an easy thing for an individual to bring forward and to sponsor that would show that they actually are committed to transparency and making sure that all of the meetings are noticed in a format that I think a majority of Waltham residents rely on nowadays. Yeah, I mean, it wouldn't even be that hard. And also, we don't even need the council. Uh, our friend Joe Vizard could just walk outside. Well, he, as he walks inside to his job every single day, just take a picture of the freaking sign and then notice and then tell Kathy in the clerk's office, please update this and then put it online. It would be very, very easy. Yeah. Uh, so we wouldn't even need the council. But if the council wanted to be straightforward, a resolution would, mm -hmm. would cover that. Um, I also had... Uh, captioning as a high. Um, also, it is a low, but I, it, it was a high for me, definitely. It's probably the biggest high for me this this session was that uh, thing, and maybe because there's some back like history between me and uh, the council there. I started recording meetings back in 2018, um, pretty much when I started going to every single one of these meetings, um, and I started putting them online. It was just me, just putting it online, and uh, for some context. Only three out of about seven, eight, or nine uh, meetings um, are recorded, and so a majority of the conversations that are happening, and these are you know these are conversations about laws that affect us and and you know lawmakers that live here. Uh, most of that stuff went unrecorded. The the minutes uh, taken there are insufficient and uh, absent most of the time, and so uh, you know for years and years and years we did that, um, and so. From 2018 to 2020, I was basically doing it myself. And then uh, and Josh talked a little bit about Joey taking up this uh, mantle to do it. And uh, to Josh's credit, Joey does credit Josh's campaign uh, that Josh put online as the impetus for him deciding to do this. And so it shows that you should not do this kind of stuff alone. No need to work by yourself. You should get organized with other people and you will have a much better um, Results. Um, and it also it would be, if we're still, still talking about this, we'd be remiss to not mention that George Darcy uh, laid the groundwork for years. He, I think he tried three on three separate occasions over the years to try and do this. So he put a lot of the uh, legwork into uh, recording these meetings already. And Joey kind of just like finished it. He took it up and uh, ran with it and finished it. Um, and so credit to Joey uh, where credit is due. <laughs> One of the things that got got to me with this whole exchange was the the, the, the thing you mentioned with the smug self satisfaction at having a way to successfully obfuscate things and only yeah. just having it discovered. And to contrast that, like it's it's the uh, fixation on like being correct within the letter of the law, despite the fact that like the law.
law as it's understood doesn't necessarily mean that it's moral or ethical or anything. It just means that it's technically legal. We're going to get to this in another one, but like when when it came to like representing homeowners' interests and wanting to see uh, like renters not allowed to rent in the city, that wasn't that was not the expressed concern. And like you know, not it wasn't so much about what was legal. I mean, it was about what was maximally possible within the letter of the law. You know, damn the consequences. Mm -hmm. and that's kind of the attitude that they seem to be putting out there for a lot of things. Yeah, that complaint I put in was basically me saying like, you you did this in a very untransparent, untransparent uh, manner and you should strive to do better. And also it was legal. And they were like, it's not illegal. <laughs> everything else you said is true. But we, we did everything we were supposed to, which was put it on a bulletin board outside of city hall and do nothing else. Despite every other meeting being in the docket on the same day at the city council meetings. I just, one more thing yeah, on that yeah, same yeah, topic. Yeah, yeah. Um, while this complaint was in progress, I got curious and did a little bit of research. And um, last year, the last like 12 months has been a record year for the number of open meeting law complaints filed in the state of Massachusetts. Um, and I don't know if that has been a result of outstanding negligence on the part of local elected bodies, or if it's because of organizations like these three guys have been doing here and people are actually paying more attention. Um, with the pandemic, go, go, so many councils going online really made a huge impact on accessibility. And I wonder if coming out of that, people are reacting to what is perceived as backsliding on transparency. And um, the open meeting law is enforced by the attorney general in the state of Massachusetts, who will be on the ballot, um, the primary in September and the general in November. So this is an issue that impacts you locally, but that is managed at the statewide level. So do your research, do your homework on the attorney general's race this fall and make sure you're voting somebody who's going to be uh, enforcing the kind of transparency that we want, even if local bodies are trying to skirt the issue. That's right. Yeah, and I agree. I think the reason complaints have gone up is because when things were online and then when municipalities went back to not doing them online, they cut off access to a lot of real people who can't go out in person to meetings because they're susceptible to COVID or any number of other reasons, especially now that they're not wearing masks in mm -hmm. any of the meetings. And uh, I think a lot of people were like, how can they do this? So they com maybe complained about things that technically weren't illegal, but were very much not in keeping with the spirit of the open meeting law. So I agree they, that attorney that um, attorney general's role to um, interpret that is really important right now. I think. Um, one of the lows for me uh, this session was I was a little underwhelmed by just the topics that were brought up. I mean, we we do a good job here of trying to like talk about the interesting things and like make this fun and, and interesting to talk about. But I mean, from going to these meetings for years, uh, in the past sessions, like we used to talk about like real shit. Like we used to have packed chambers with topics that we would argue for and against mm -hmm. uh, for hours. We used to have great special hearings. We used to have great citizen input sessions um, talking about real stuff. Like, there's been very little conversations in this session about affordable housing, about climate change, about revitalizing the South Side, about equity. There's been very, very little discussions about that. And in the past, there have been. Not to say that there haven't been cool and interesting things, uh, but just I feel like it's just been less. So I've been a little underwhelmed by that. Um, of course, we still have another six months um, for the session as well. Yeah, I wonder. Um, yeah, I definitely agree that that's been the trend this session um and i wonder if part of it is due to turnover within the council that at this point a majority of counselors have been around less than six years i think um and less so the five. ones that i off the top of my head that i know have been around a while kathy mcminiman george darcy john mclaughlin um all three of them are very busy with big responsibilities as members of the council of course we have kathy mcminiman who's the council president now which is typically a role that doesn't, tries not to really drive an agenda. They, they're more about managing the meetings. And I, I actually respect that she's been not pushing for a lot of things, but running fair, decent meetings from my eye. Um, mm -hmm. And then Councillor Darcy is the chair of rules and ordinances, which means he's got a lot of paperwork to keep track of, interfacing with the law department, making sure the hearings are scheduled and connecting with all of the parties that need to be in all of those meetings. Um, the clerk obviously does a lot of that heavy lifting for him, but it's still something that he has to keep an eye on. And then 
John McLaughlin is obviously the vice president of the council. So he's running meetings as well, um, probably very busy behind the scenes. And then we have a bunch of new counselors who are still learning the ropes and maybe feeling their way through trying to decide what to raise and what not to raise. So um, I wonder if it's an experience thing that is partly driving this. Um, I agree 100%. Um, and later in the show, we're going to talk about how the new counselors did. And then I'm going to talk a little bit more about uh, what you just talked about. Um, so I'll save, I'll save that. If I can respond to that, actually, one of the things I was going to say is a high, which probably no one's expecting me to say, is I really like how um, President McMenamin um, runs the meetings. Um, it's not super friendly, but it's very efficient and it's very consistent and fair. And I love her rapport with uh, Clerk Bazaar. <laughs> they work together really well. He has a sense of humor and he seems to have proven that she has a sense of humor. Um, if I show a clip, it's going to be bizarre <laughs> talking about having to read a resolution about tattoos and which had the word dermis in it, which is just means skin, but it sounds like a dirty <laughs> word. <laughs> to perform skin pigment modification by inserting ink, dyes, and pigments, either indelibly or temporarily, uh, into the dermis layer of the skin <laughs> to form design e expression of artistic talents. I really like that. That was a high for me for whatever reason. But um, I disagree pretty strongly with some of the things Councilor McMenamin has said when she's been speaking as a member of the Committee of the Whole or one of the committees. But I think um, the way she runs the meetings is great. She There's a fine line because you want all the members to understand what they're voting on. But some members are it seems like they zone out and they're a little too quick to admit they don't know what's going <laughs> on. So it's like she can't like coddle them too much. So there, I remember there was one time and I forget what the issue was, but there were like amendments on top of amendments. And one of the counselors said, so what does a yes vote do? And what does a no vote do again? And she said, well, a yes vote means you're voting to approve the motion. And a no vote means you're, <laughs> but it was like, she had to do that because it was people were taking way too long trying to clarify things that they really should have understood at that point. So that was a high point for me. She definitely did a good job of following the procedure this, this session. Oh yeah, she's, she's a master of Robert's rules. And that's what's hard, to, That's it's a topic that's hard to talk about when you're talking about the council with people that know the characters, but not like they don't like watch these meetings. So when like, you know, you're talking about the council and like, you know, you say something nice about Kathleen McMiniman, people are like, Kathleen McMiniman, I hate that person. She's got terrible opinions. And she's like, well, yeah, she's got some problematic opinions. She runs an okay meeting. Like you cannot take that away from her. She understands Robert's rules and she's very fair with them. Uh, and so you, you have people like that all the time. God forbid I bring up the name Paul Brasco. He's a, uh, you know, he's got awful opinions. Probably one of the worst people I ever met. He, <laughs> he ran to find me. So uh, I can't, can't take that away from him. One of the highs for me, and hopefully we can play this clip again, is Randy LeBlanc uh, during the uh, special hearing on one of the marijuana establishments asking how long it takes edibles to kick in. If, if somebody comes in and purchases edibles um, and was to take one, what is the timeline of effects? Let's say they took one and they were driving. What is the timeline of effects that the it, it takes place on? And for some reason, that just like killed me so so hard. Um, it reminded me. I can't. I actually looked beforehand and I can't find the clip because WCAC deletes them eventually. Um, in 2019, Robert Waddick, who is our city clerk, uh, who is our old city clerk, used to be the Ward Six City Councilor. Um, during a special hearing, he. We were talking about uh, marijuana establishments all the way back then. Um, and they were talking about someone brought gummy bears and like, uh, and if those were gonna be sold and the session ends and all you hear is Robert Roddick on a hot mic say, uh, can I get one of those gummy bears? <laughs> <laughs> and just, I, miss, I miss funny things like that. But Joe Bizarre is actually very comical. So he brings some levity to it. Um, there's some counselors that are no longer here that brought levity. Um, so it's nice when someone does. That, that was a really fun bit from Randy, but honestly, like it was tempered by having to hear the same bit over oh and over God, again yeah. from five different like marijuana establishments. Yeah, so, yeah. yeah we, we would be remiss to not bring up that like eight percent of the entire city council session was just marijuana hearings that we already heard before from the last session yeah. because they were redoing yeah. it for yeah. new counselors. Yeah, yeah, and and like I feel like there's a difference between. 
admitting that you don't use marijuana and maybe you don't know what's going on and like having been on the council for four or five years and maybe taking a minute to google it or like asking at a previous public hearing um just a lot of the concerns about marijuana at this point to me feel a little disingenuous uh in terms of both the the like biological science and the social science around it. Um, and obviously everybody who comes in front of the council on these hearings has an agenda. And thank God the um, oh, whatever conservative organization is has stopped showing up. Mm -hmm. When I was on the council, they wouldn't muster the troops to come out and say, won't somebody you think of the children and marijuana destroys lives, blah, blah, blah. Um, and they once passed out like this 200 page document with just the worst citations I've ever seen, frankly. Um, because I'm a huge nerd, I went and looked up what the actual reality was compared to what they were presenting in that document, and it was just a hot mess. Um, but like we've been having this conversation in front of the council for five years, and Waltham voters approved it six years ago. Like at some point, you got to stop dragging your feet. Yeah, that's um, the 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 pot shops issue is a weird one in this session because in some ways we saw a change in that now it seems like they do want to make it happen and if something might happen at this meeting in July 11th it doesn't seem like they're dragging their heels the way they were before but technically nothing happened there were five <laughs> hearings there was a, a report from a traffic engineer that didn't say what the counselors wanted to say and we're gonna find out what the result of that is July 11th, hopefully. But technically nothing happened. And, it, and as, as Chris said, it took up a pretty substantial chunk of the time and the council. And I can understand the fairness of wanting the, um, you know, the new counselors to be able to hear the presentation. That makes mm -hmm. sense. But when you take the big picture and you see how much time they spent on the issue that they really didn't move forward at all, at least not in a way that was visible to us, it's pretty disappointing. And they could have just watched the, the hearing. Exactly. <laughs> they could have just clicked the button and watched the hearing. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> like a record. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, I know, I know. <laughs> uh, and, and just for suspense, uh, there are currently five uh, people vying for a marijuana license. Oh, I forget what the correct terms are. Um, and only four people are going to get it. Um, so we think maybe on July 11th that, that will be revealed. But right. I'm going to guess no. No, probably not. They probably they're going to reveal some aspect of how they're making the decision, but they're not going to reveal the, the actual decision. We were thinking when they first announced it, maybe it would be like the, the finale of a reality show where they'd announce it and the losers would have to hug the winner and pretend like they were, they were sorry for them. I don't think it's going to be like that because they don't usually do things like that. They're probably going to announce some information that's not the whole answer. Um, on July 11th, which is disappointing. Kathleen McCormick has a single blunt. <laughs> <laughs> she would. She would not go anywhere near any marijuana, just on the off chance it absorbs through the skin. James touched on the same thing that was a low that I think was a low for all of us, and and so one of the big issues people talk a lot about in Waltham is housing there were only really two housing discussions going on. One was Councillor Paz introduced the resolution for having something to do with tenants' rights, but we don't know the outcome he's going for yet. It might be that I thought of this after last conversation. Now, the watch CPC resolution, the one that they drafted requiring, oh. maybe oh, that's what Paz, maybe Paz is setting the stage to put forth that resolution. Mm -hmm. I have a feeling that that's probably the reason to have the discussion and say, based on the discussion, we're going to introduce this, this thing that's he because they brought he had watch come into the discussion so I, that makes sense okay so when we get to predictions i'm gonna predict that paz is gonna <laughs> introduce the watch cd resolution um but yeah so there was that conversation about housing which was very much um seemed to be talking about renters and tenants but we don't know specifically what it's going to do yet and then the only other discussion about housing was the one that councillor durkey brought in which was about the issue of uh renters but mostly college students having loud parties and doing other things that destroy the quality of life of their single family homeowner neighbors. And there was a very lengthy discussion about that. And it seemed like a low point to me of this session, because for one thing, they were talking about zoning issues. And as a few 
um, Councillor has pointed out, if someone's violating a zoning issue, a zoning law, it's the landlord. But the whole meeting was not about landlords. It was just anger directed at college students, for, with a few exceptions and mm -hmm. people who push back on that. And it also seemed very hypocritical because uh, they were completely talking about everything from the point of view of homeowners, which as Christine mentioned when I interviewed her back in January, so it brings out how counselors sort of see different tiers of constituents, like who do they actually represent? And in this conversation, they were all representing homeowners, it seemed like, or almost all. And uh, some of them we know are also landlords who are probably making money off of renting out houses in single family neighborhoods. We don't know which they are because that's not an easy thing to look up because people who have income properties usually put it in an LLC. So if you look it up in the property record, it doesn't say their name, but it just felt like there was this undercurrent of hypocrisy of this council where several of them are probably landlords having this discussion where they pretended like landlords didn't exist. Well, and also exclusively centered like the single family homeowners or is the, mm -hmm. the sanctuary based on that uh, yeah. Report. yeah yeah so basically mm -hmm. centering them as these people who are entitled to above and beyond like whatever like and, and that's not to say that like like you should be ignoring zoning for all this like the landlords aren't in the right for doing this either there needs to be like a comprehensive approach to housing that isn't mm -hmm. just out like making it illegal for people to rent in places and like you can see like kind of like the like the the nation the national impact of stuff like this because like a month after uh, councillor Durkee introduced this resolution uh, a resolution similar to this passed in uh in, uh well one one that implemented something similar to what this resolution was pursuing passed in shawnee kansas basically bit prohibiting the renting along these lines of anyone of it, more than four people in a, in a dwelling or whatever they're yeah on. So when I was in college in Northfield, Minnesota, which is a pretty small town, um, I don't actually know how it compares to the size of Waltham. Also had two colleges, uh, slightly different from Waltham because we have two universities. Um, but there was an ordinance in front of their city council that would have prohibited more than three unrelated persons from living together. Um, and the students on campus <laughs> got all up in arms and acted this about like how that was going to impact extended family networks and immigrants and blah 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 um but as students we were all really motivated by self-interest in that as well because people who wanted to live off campus wanted to live off campus and to be able to do that um well, also the reality is that the people who are living off campus are living off campus because they can come to a cheaper arrangement mm -hmm. than living on campus and this all comes back to not enough housing and rather yeah. than taking real steps to increase the housing supply outside of like whatever market like you know outside of a market solution is off the table you know, like can't pursue it yeah I'm, a, I'm actually agreeing with a lot of the folks that are in this discussion i just think they're going about it the wrong way i agree that brandeis is not offering enough uh housing that people actually want to live in so the conversation should be brandeis should build more housing not we should stop residents of Waltham from living together and mm -hmm. there's going to be a lot of repercussions not just on college students but on working class people on immigrants yes um and i think it's a very scary conversation and notably that is going to rules and ordinances now so that we will actually see something like that come into play we'll actually see a law being built um so we'll keep an eye on that um i if i was going to make a prediction i would predict that nothing comes from it because it just seems so yeah, yeah, like out of out of place. The but. one thing I did see was the auditor. I think it was. Okay, I forget if it was the auditor or the solicitor in that particular meeting. But basically, the the person who was fielding questions from uh, the council at that point was talking about like how his issue was like he was one of uh, like the ability to enforce it and stuff. Was that like, the building inspector, Bill Forte? I believe that. Believe that might have yeah, been. yeah. <laughs> so the, that was part of the other reason it was a frustrating conversation because there were actually two conversations now that i think of it because first they brought in the solicitor and you know, Durkee and some of the other counselors asked him basically could we pass an ordinance that prevents college students from living in mm. or unrelated people from living in a, a certain number of unrelated people from living in a house 
And the solicitor basically said, yes, he described case law from the Supreme Court where that's where that language of a, a single family zone being a sanctuary comes from. And basically cities can ban anything that, that is inconsistent with that sanctuary. So he left the city council thinking he may be a good lawyer, but he's not good at explaining stuff to the council <laughs> because whenever he comes in, they seem more confused than when he, so he left them thinking like, yes, they could, there's no reason. And, and so then they brought in the building inspector and they basically asked him, well, you know, we already have rules that say if you have a certain number of unrelated people, then that should be a boarding house or some other definition. That's not single family zoning. So why can't you just use that to uh, against these college houses? And he basically explained, I can't just, uh, I can't um, decide when to enforce something or not. I can't selectively enforce, um, you know, I need an actual law to enforce. And he explained that enforcement doesn't have much teeth because basically he can fine people. And then if they don't pay the fines, the solicitor then negotiates a settlement. They don't usually go to court. Mm -hmm. So those settlements are what determine how much leverage he has, uh, which is interesting and relevant to what the counselors were talking about, but it didn't have much effect on the conversation because they still, yeah, they didn't have a very practical way to go with it. But he had to basically explain to them that what the city solicitor told them was misleading. They didn't have the kind of power uh, that he led them to believe. And related to that too, is like the, if you start enforcing this, it starts to apply more in, in more, can it start to apply it in more places than just like college students? Mm -hmm. And yeah, and, and that's where you start to, it, 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 because it's a pretty common occurrence across the city for people to be rooming together. In yeah. Situations like that. And he said he didn't want his staff to be involved in deciding who's a family. He said this does come up because when it comes up with a possibly illegal boarding houses, sometimes to decide if mm -hmm. it fits the definition, you have to ask about if people are related. And he said, you, you can't rely on that. There are all kinds of problems with trying to define who's related. And it's a lot of the same people who are the most like vocal, like, you know, small government types and yes. that are, like, pushing this, which is basically amounts to like a police state kind of approach. Yeah. yeah, it's amazing how people who are libertarians when it comes to national politics have no problem telling their neighbors what they can and can't do on their own property or demanding that the government tell their neighbors what they can and can't do. One of the highs for me um, was actually uh, Ward 6 City Councilor Sean Durkee's resolution around removing language um, from city ordinances. Um, in was it, April, he brought in a resolution that uh, asked the law department to come up with a plan to remove um, a term that people with, uh, people with intellectual disabilities um, is now uh, want to do away with a, a term. Um, and so there's a, that term is used a lot in our city ordinances. And so Chandra is asking the law department to come up with a plan to remove it and replace it with people with intellectual disabilities. Um, and so that was a high for me. Uh, is, uh, I mean, I've, I've never really been a big fan of um, toothless resolutions, just like proclamations. Um, but what I liked about uh, Sean is, first of all, yeah, I don't see that very much from him. And second of all, I like how he did it. And it was to work with opportunities for inclusion. And so instead of, you know, a lot of these counselors have big egos, they want to do everything themselves, they think they know better, but to really go work with a group that knows what they're talking about and then work with them and then just be the uh, conduit for a resolution. Um, I really enjoyed how that resolution was made and how it was executed. Um, so props to Sean for that one. That's true. I'd almost forgotten about that one. Yeah. Yeah. Mm -hmm. That was early. Yeah. Hold on. Good on him. Uh, uh, that also reminds me the pride resolution I thought was a high. Um, mm -hmm. Counselor Bradley MacArthur submitted it. I know uh, Paz was also in on it early on, and then several other counselors signed on. Mm -hmm. And um, it was so, well, we'll talk more about Councilor Bradley MacArthur, but what it, what reminded me of it is what you said is sometimes a symbolic resolution is actually pretty important, a symbolic gesture, like taking that word out of the, the um, laws, the ordinances. And so the pride resolution is a symbolic gesture too, but I thought it was a pretty important one given the timing, given that there's only yeah. been one in the past. And the fact that it explicitly said that the um, taking books from the Little Queer Library and the attempts to ban books in the high school were acts of bigotry. 
Yeah. I was actually surprised that it said that. And so I'm really happy about it. The, my only worry about it is I think there are other communities who could use that kind of acknowledgement, um, maybe not at any particular time, but I think um, the Black community, the Asian community are both very concerned about not just being unwelcome, but being, uh, being, targeted. being targeted for yeah. violence. Yeah, and I think that should be acknowledged. Um, more so than it has in the past. And you did uh, Asian hate resolution mm -hmm. and a BLM resolution, mm -hmm. and the BLM resolution was somewhat controversial, was, right? Yes. So was the API one, too. Yeah, more, more than I thought it was. Um, speaking of, uh, Christine, I appreciate calling and bringing that private resolution in, but I mean, nothing is going to top Christine's first private resolution. And so everything else is just. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> but, it, but it was just, I mean, you, Christine, you bringing that in was just a home run of epic proportions. And definitely, I think about, I still think about it sometimes. It was a really good, good moment in That's, city council history. I really appreciate you saying that. I think it's very kind. Mm -hmm. And um, looking back on that, I, it was a little selfish the way I went about that. And I stand behind it hundred percent. It was the right thing to do. Um, I absolutely think I did the right thing. And why do you say it was selfish? Cause you just brought it in. Cause I made it about myself. Mm -hmm. I made it about myself very explicitly. Like, mm -hmm. look, here is who I am. I'm already on the council. Mm -hmm. So get on board and get out of the way. Um, <laughs> and I, th I think that's important, especially because there were other people that are on the LGBT spectrum um, and they didn't really bring it up in their political lives. Yeah. And so you bringing it up is, you know, was a good yeah. invitation to, yeah. you know, we often don't talk about these kinds of things, but we should. Yeah, I, I've kind of been reflecting on that the last six months and for a while. Um, but I spoke to somebody very active in the city who shortly after I did that asked like, why did you do that? Why did you think it was important? Because like, I was one of the first same-sex marriages in the city of Waltham, and I've never felt the need to like get big and loud about it and like celebrate that fact. And um, I think that, especially right now, when people are trying to push us queer folks back into the closet, it's important to say who we are and where we are and that we stand for each other. Um, because it's so easy if somebody's just quietly living their life to pretend like we don't exist. Uh, especially me being involved primarily in opposite sex relationships during my public life, it's very easy for somebody to say, oh, she's just an average straight woman. Um, not that there's anything wrong with that, but there's nothing wrong with being queer either. And like being open about that shows the community that we're here and it shows like the youth that we're here and it's okay to be who you are and that there are adults who are gonna be out here sticking up for you. Um, and that's really important. Yeah, that's, I'm glad you said that. We thought about this a lot, planning Pride and at Pride, how everyone's at a different place and sometimes symbolic gestures that seem, you know, not a big deal to one set of people can be a really big deal to someone else. And um, the mayor was at Pride and I think she got this and that's why she was there. She wasn't there to be the center of attention. She gave a very quick speech. But she wanted people to know that yes, you know this 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 uh, event in this community rise to the level of something the mayor is going to come out and talk about publicly. So it meant a lot to all of us, even if we don't always agree with the mayor on many things. It meant a lot that she was there and that the principal was there for the same reason, and you mm -hmm. really saw it. You know, it meant a big deal to kids who were there. Yeah. Um, you know, and so yeah, symbolic gestures can go a long way when you do them at the right time and the mm -hmm. right way. Yeah. You, you touched on it too, but like earlier in the year, it's worth remembering us is probably also low, but like there was the uh, the attempt to ban the books mm -hmm. and the school committee meeting was very well attended with students from the school. Yeah. And it was very well attended from members of the community too, which is good to see. But mm -hmm. it's, it's it's been an interesting ride going from that early early in the year in February to the Pride Resolution. And yeah. Then, yeah. Well, and it's only what is 2019, I think you did yours. Or 2018? 2018. It's only 2018. So it's that's only four years to go from the first person ever talking about anything queer in a public mm -hmm. meeting in Waltham mm -hmm. to huge festival on the common. So that that was pretty awesome. And and so I think it shows why it was important because every little per every person who's out just makes another person a little yeah. more likely to be out and to be talking about it. So any other highs, lows? Um, I think one that was related to the budget hearings. Yes. I wanted to at least bring up, uh, there was a lot of back and forth, and it was, it was a very long 
the hearing, but one of the ones that jumped out at me was uh, La Fauci, who started the, the questioning, on, uh, uh, I think started the questioning the superintendent, but he, he had, a lot of the, the, the things he was talking about were using very, using a lot of euphemisms to describe things. So like, instead of referring to the teachers unions, he was referring to it as budget item number one or whatever, something, something, something similar to that, sort of trying to remove explicitly what he's talking about from what he was talking about and like encoding things in euphemisms. So, and it's like, these are the people who are looking after your kids and you're acting like it's too much to be paying them money. And seeing, seeing that type of attitude being reflected by a lot of the people on city mm -hmm. council is extremely concerning. And mm -hmm. to, for that to be one yeah. of the last meetings of the, the, the session and then have them all basically, all except for Paz and uh, Colleen Bradley MacArthur voted to get voted for that budget against all objections. It's just like they really aren't taking that much public input, is what it looks like. Um, yeah, I was going to list that meeting as one of my lows too. Is what we're talking about. It was technically a finance committee meeting, although a bunch of additional counselors ended up speaking, and it was one of the last ones before they passed the budget, and it was they questioned the superintendent and they had gotten hundreds of emails about the budget and uh, they grilled the superintendent um, for almost two hours. And there were some very good issues raised and there was a lot of nonsense and grandstanding. And uh, we talked about LaCava's, Councilor LaCava's comments that were problematic a lot already. So I'm glad you're, we're now focusing on LaFosse <laughs> because he is, yeah, he he brought up some things that needed to be brought up. Like he was basically demanding wage theft was one of the things because he was bringing up as an issue that the teachers were having like professional development days and they were getting a half day for students pretty routinely on like Wednesdays. Yeah, as like he was complaining about the cost of of basically having the buses for only a half day. Why can't you have them for mm -hmm. a full day? And it's like it very very much shows that he used this as a daycare and everything else is in service of that purpose of it being a daycare. And yeah, with that type of attitude, it's not. A, it's no wonder we're having issues with teacher retention and stuff like mm -hmm. that. Like, it's just like, well, he also he brought up things that were some things that needed to be brought up, like like sexual assault in the schools. That's something important to talk about publicly. But he also brought up some stuff that was totally unfair. I thought, like for example, he he noted that the uh, school, both the school committee and the council, had received hundreds of emails, and that some of the school committee members were there. And he said he felt bad for them that they're getting these emails saying they don't care about our students when it was really the superintendent's fault because he didn't involve them enough in the budgeting process. He didn't do enough uh, budget, uh, budget workshops. But the thing is, they voted on it. And they voted on it. That's their only job. And they voted on it. So that was completely unfair. They they have more responsibility for that decision than the superintendent does. And he was trying to put it all on the superintendent. And he knew he was going to look good from the point of view of people who were really angry at the superintendent because he really grilled mm -hmm. them. But he basically he he was my least favorite type of leader, which is the one who thinks that all, you know, the best thing he contribute is to tell you what you're doing wrong and tell you where you're in a rude way. So you stress about it and what he was actually the things he were actually saying some were valid some were not but there was no point to it beyond mm -hmm. i think you're incompetent i don't really care what your budget says because i'm sure it's wrong because it's you and i thought it was really a low point like the definitely the superintendent bears some responsibility for those um problems but i definitely felt sorry and embarrassed uh that he had to sit for third um stand through two hours of that yeah one thing just I have a pit in my stomach to even bring this up, but Anthony LaFauci coming on so strong about the sexual harassment and assault felt really gross to me. Um, he never harassed me to a level that I felt was reportable as sexual harassment, but he would make gross comments. Um, and I hate saying this out publicly. He just, he was always just a little bit gross. Nothing that I was ever like, dude, you're being fucking gross. Um, nothing that I ever called him out for or reported, but just, and then for him to bring this up felt very like, as our father of daughters, I now know that it's unethical for me to bowl a pile of livers in my backyard from all the women I've killed because everybody couldn't be like my daughter. Um, shout out to Danny Lavery who wrote that piece like a decade ago. Um, it just felt like grandstanding. I think if he actually gave a crap about the safety of students and especially young women in the schools, he would be doing a lot more. 
to protect vulnerable populations in this city, which often does include young women and especially young women of color. And this was just an opportunity for him to take pot shots at a system that he is not satisfied with. And I, I'm very angry about it. I'm very angry and I'm very disgusted. <laughs> And to, to tie this back to the, thing, the actually the attempt to ban books in the schools, a lot of this comes comes from the angle of trying to go after public education in general. Yes. And like it's it's not saying that these are this is one group of people all acting in a coordinated manner, but they share a common objective, which is stripping down public schools, diverting money from public schools to private education. COVID has pressed the accelerator on that because people just want to get their kids even to school one way or the other. And if it means putting them to private education, the ones who can afford to do that are going to do that. And now after two years of COVID, they're like acting as if, why can't we just go back to the schedule the way it was, everything the way that it was before. And the world is more complicated than that. You can't just put the genie back into the bottle mm -hmm. for a lot of this stuff. And they're acting like it's the it's superintendent's fault that we can't just go back to the way the world was two and a half yeah. years ago. And that's like not being based in reality. And again, it's just political grandstanding and maybe trying to trying to score points. Yeah, most counselors figure out pretty quickly how to make it seem like their agenda is hidden when they're like giving lines of questioning. But Anthony still hasn't really figured it out. It's very clear when he's just doing something for his own agenda, when he's just trying to gain points. It, it, it's, it's his tone of voice. You can always you can always tell. He has to figure out how to mask that if he wants people to seem I like it seems like it's genuine. No, I sorry to, to naysay you on your okay. own show. But, <laughs> I mean, that's fine. I think this is who he is and I think it makes him feel powerful powerful that he gets to be that way in well, front of the whole city. Oh it's just not genuine and people see that. So yeah. I don't know what he's gonna gain from it. Yeah, I think he's he he's, he appeals to people who have this idea that they want someone tough, and I think Councillor McMenamin a little bit appeals to that too. It's like they sometimes see someone who's being a little bit rude or aggressive towards the person they're questioning as that's a tough watchdog of our interests. Mm -hmm. But it's not always. It depends on what they're actually asking. You know, the that that kind of tone and that attitude isn't really what makes them tough if tough means being effective you know you put people on the spot asking what kinds of meaningless questions and ha and it put on an affect of like being a like a, like you said a tough watchdog or whatever but that doesn't mean that the things you're asking are ba like are reflecting reality yeah and then LaFauci also showed up late. I'm not sure the right way to say it. They always say LaFosse in the council meeting. So I tried to say LaFosse, but they also say cats and I'm pretty sure he told me it's Kate. Yeah. Yep. Mm -hmm. I'm pretty yeah, sure. So I so, for me. <laughs> <laughs> so yeah. So uh, Lafauci or Lafasi, uh, he also showed up when they were talking about. They had the special meeting to talk about your complaint. He showed up like in workout clothes to show mm -hmm. that he didn't care, and he sat there like mm -hmm. notice, and that we have not selected. Um, I mean, basically, but he appeals to people who who like that kind of leader, that kind of like yeah, dude like, who everybody thinks is the leader because he's not afraid to be a jerk in front of everyone. Yeah, it was it was sixteen hundred people thought so? But uh, isn't that what Ward One votes with well, to win sixteen hundred? I don't think it, I'm going to look it up. Um, Anthony Lafauci won with eight hundred and fifty votes. Oh, that's not even that's, that's not even half of it. Yeah. <laughs> Actually, that reminds me of something. We were talking about tattoos. Oh, so oh out of out of eleven hundred and twenty-three total. So uh, a decisive margin, but fewer voters than. Got yeah, it. yeah. Interesting. So we we can you? Sh I was going to ask you when we had the show where we were talking about tattoos to show your hand or your watch tattoo. Yeah. So it? because I think viewers need to know. So <laughs> I mean, so I've got a Waltham watch tattooed on my uh, arm and I got it the day after my own city council race ended. And it shows the time of um, uh, how many votes I got, 317. So take that with me. Is it, I think that's great. Mm -hmm. He didn't win, but he was so grateful for 316 people Seven. voting for him. 317. <laughs> 317. Yeah. You're that you're lucky the the, the, the tens place didn't go. Oh no, time. I thought about that. I was going to figure something out. But <laughs> thankfully, I got a dismal number of votes. So. <laughs> I have a watch tattoo also, but you my do? my time is the date of my election, eleven seventeen. Oh 11, nice! 17, yeah. Oh, I didn't know that. Oh, so there's a there's a trend going now. Yeah. 
it's a wash city and it's a very classic tattoo motif so <laughs> mm -hmm. and soon you may actually be able to get a tattoo in the wash mm -hmm. city yeah um we can move on to uh one of the only other things we can talk about um how did the new counselors paul Kate, and colleen bradley mccarthy Most of so I think on balance, uh, Colleen Bradley MacArthur did really well this, this session, considering it was her first session, and she also had like multiple resolutions get through at this point. And also, uh, really, like one of the things that she was working on was like the bus resolution, which I meant to talk about as a high, but like getting like bringing in a thing related to that and having the MBTA show up was kind of cool. Did she have a part in doing that? Yeah, yeah, she, I believe she reached out to them. That was one of the actions. Yeah, she, she helped set it up. I don't know who else did, but she was definitely involved in it. Yeah, well, and that's a, a disclaimer we should give this. You know, when we talk about how individual counselors are doing, we're talking about the part that we see in the meeting. Mm -hmm. Oh, yeah. You know, there, there could be some who are doing a lot of work behind the scenes that we don't know about. I wanted, yeah, I, want, I wanted to bring that up, and this is a good point, is that, you know, a lot of our show, we talk about the city council and what the city councils are doing at the city council, but that's not all what the city councilors do. Yeah. And there are plenty of counselors like, um, like John McLaughlin, like Karen Dunn, and some in the past that don't really bring up much at the city council, but are receptive and they answer emails and they, you know, they put out newsletters. Mm -hmm. And so it's not the only, the only, you know, we're talking about resolutions and stuff, but that's not it. Like, you know, being say. receptive is important, as important, if not more important. Um, so, you know, we give a lot of criticism for a lot of people, but, you know, people vote for them for a reason. Yes. And so yeah. uh, they could just be more receptive. Mm -hmm. um, I thought I thought Colleen did very well. Um, you know, she has a she has big shoes to fill of the progressive counselor that everyone wants her to be, um, and it's the same for every progressive counselor that gets on. And you know, I'm guilty of it too. You know, I wanted Colleen to just break down the doors and just like change laws and and put people uh, uh, elevate uh, people in uh, groups uh, to where they should be. And it, you can't just expect people to do that, despite wanting it to happen you know people have to figure out how this works they have to figure out how the game is played they have to figure out who does what and how and who to talk to to do anything and so i thought she did a great job of um of listening to when she should be listening and talking uh when she felt like she had something to say um and really learning how all this works and then by the end yeah by the end she she uh, did the pride resolution she did the uh the the Uber question. Yeah, um, that was another example yeah. of something that's symbolic, but it was like the right symbolic. Yeah, right yeah. Time. I mean, we could talk more about that, but yeah, that, that was a whole run on her part. So voting against the budget with like explicitly saying why she was yes. voting against the budget, yeah. standing her ground on that, I thought was very good. Yeah, and oh, and and after that, you know, it was good because then Randy LeBlanc asked, "What happens if we vote no? Vote? What would a no vote mean?" Yeah. And what you was know, the answer that was given? Well, Councillor Stanley said that that would mean that the version of the budget minus any cuts the finance committee made would all automatically pass, which I'm almost certain is not correct. Yeah. If they would still have their vote to pass another version. And also the finance committee didn't make any cuts. So he, what he's saying would be that a yes and no vote would do the same thing. So I don't yeah. think he was correct about that. But this, this happens, you know, when a counselor's done, that when the counselors come in and they think they're all going to vote yes on something and then someone's going to vote no, somebody always asks, well, what happened? What <laughs> happened? And it's like, you need to know that. You shouldn't be voting yes unless you understand what a no vote does. <laughs> so, so yeah, so you know she made an impact and, and um, Councilor Pat voted against it too. You know they made an impact when someone said, what would even happen yeah. if we did that? You Just know, that's a good sign. For the record, my understanding is that if the budget doesn't pass, you go to what's called a 12-month budget where you take the last year's budget, you divide it by 12, and you level fund everything with that amount of money until such time as the council passes a new budget for the next fiscal year. That's my understanding. Um, somebody might want to check if you're thinking of voting no on a budget. <laughs> yeah, no, I'm glad because you seem to know more than many of the counselors <laughs> do about it. And the other thing that happened was, you know, Mr. Tarallo, when he made a last minute effort to reconsider the budget, the mm -hmm. school committee meeting that was happening at the same time as that hearing and Councillor McMenamin in that same hearing that we all thought was a low, um, she said, 
what's going to happen if the school committee now votes this budget and it's different than the one we have in front of us? And it's like, well, then you're going to have to negotiate and get a new budget. Like the, this whole idea that if you do something that messes up the process, then that, that or that you can't vote your conscience if it messes up the process. Yes. That's the idea. Like, yeah. like you can't, nobody knows what would happen if you would do that. It's just very silly. I can see that in the question from McMinnon to the superintendent, not to go back to that. Uh -huh. <laughs> She was very incensed that the process wasn't the same as the process that had happened. Previously. Yeah, That's yeah, funny. that was another part of that. We didn't talk about her comments, but she was also kind of grilling the superintendent in a really aggressive way and all about the process. It wasn't about, is this enough money to fund our school? It was about why did, why did you make our budgeting process harder because the schools are such a big chunk of the budget. Mm -hmm. If you mess up your role in this process, it messes it up for all of that. And she was really upset about that and basically was blaming him for the fact that the, the, the budget was controversial and that it didn't have full buy-in from the community. When the reason it was controversial was because some people thought it was too low. A lot of people thought it was too low and she never said, that she was willing to spend more. No one ever, except Councillor Paz, was the only one in that meeting who said he was willing to spend more. And that's why the whole thing was so frustrating. <laughs> but honestly, like to circle back to Colleen, I think she did a good job throughout the whole process and she definitely got her legs yeah. toward, as, as the year went on. Yeah, I agree. I think when it, when it started, it took a little while. Like I was kind of hoping we'd hear her speak up a little more, but when she did get going and put in a resolution, she made really good choices about what she addressed. And yeah, I think she did a great job. Um, on the counter of that, uh, I think Paul Cates, um, I was actually very impressed uh, with how he did his first session. He, he immediately just started he was unafraid to ask any question he wanted answered, even if the question had been answered in that meeting multiple times right before. So he, I think he took the job very seriously. I think he was unafraid to just ask whatever questions he needed answered. Um, and I think that when a righteous discussion actually does take place, hopefully, um, again, I think, I think Paul will take it very seriously and be on the right side, I think. Um, so, yeah, I, I, I don't agree with everything he said, but mm -hmm. I think he does a great job in terms of being prepared, mm -hmm. in terms of not being, not feeling that there's, it seems like there's a lot of social pressure when you're in the council, because mm -hmm. usually there aren't that many people at the meeting. And I think this is true for a lot of committees is they meet and the only people you're really interacting with during the meeting are the other members. So mm -hmm. when you're in the minority on an issue, there's a lot of like interpersonal pressure to kind of just go along with the group. And he, and, you know, I think um, Colleen was very aware of that and she was putting in a lot of thought into how she, and, uh, but Councillor Cates was taking more risks in terms of just asking questions without knowing if it was gonna annoy somebody. And I think that that's great. I'm glad he does that. And um, yeah, I think he's, he's been a really good presence in most of these conversations. Mm -hmm. yeah, you definitely see the annoyance bubble to the surface in some of the exchanges. Mm -hmm. and. Honestly, like some of the marijuana hearings definitely felt a lot longer because of the Yeah, yeah, he, he but, was trying but, to. <laughs> he was right, he was trying to be fair in those hearings yeah. and ask the same questions of everyone, which made them very long, but it was a good impulse. He was just uh, trying to be fair. So. Yeah. yeah, and I mean, I think that's what a lot, of Paul does, uh, a lot of what Paul does is he tries to be fair. The problem is that you can't be fair all the time. You have to, you have to decide who you are going to represent and who you are going to push for and who you're going to vote with. And uh, so I, I didn't really come up this session, but it, it will come up eventually. He's, he can't be fair all the time. Um, I'll be interested to see what happens when that happens. That's a really astute observation. As a mm -hmm. counselor at some point, you're not going to be able to be everyone's friend anymore. And you, you have a chance to pick who your friends are. You have to pick who you're going to stand up for and who you're not. And it's nice uh, that people are trying <laughs> to represent everybody equally, um, but at some point you can't. Uh, how's Paul doing as the as his um, predecessor? As his predecessor, I am not going to comment. I think <laughs> I I respect Paul a lot for stepping up and running when he did, um, and I know that my voice speaks pretty loudly to some folks, and he shouldn't be able to stand on his own. And he's doing a great job with that. So.
I'm going to keep my opinions close to the chest on this one. <laughs> if he wants to know what I think, he's welcome to give me a call. <laughs> <laughs> Any predictions for September? Um, I predict that they won't be recording and captioning the meetings yet, and mm -hmm. we're going to have to follow up on that. Um, I predict that the upcoming August meeting about the fernal is going to be interesting because the, the mayor is going to try to get an approval to do something at the fernal without answering questions about a broader plan. Mm -hmm. And I think there are some counselors who are maybe willing to push back on that, maybe. Mm -hmm. So that should be interesting. I think Councillor Paz will bring forward that resolution we discussed uh, about notifying tenants of their rights. And I hope he's successful. I think that would be a big deal. And um, I really hope the issue of sidewalk safety comes back up. Um, you mentioned, you mentioned the, so we've talked about a bunch of things that are relevant to the, the community of uh, disabled people. Um, but one that's really important to that community that has not gotten addressed at all yet is sidewalk safety. And we know Councillor Harris introduced some kind of resolution and we may have missed some meetings where it was discussed, maybe, but as far as we know, nothing's happened with that. So I really hope that's something that comes up. I really hope there's more discussions pertaining to housing besides the one that have already started. There should be at least one new affordable housing project somewhere in town that we at least get to talk about <laughs> in this year. I mean, some of the stuff that I'm hopeful for, um, or at least hopeful for seeing, I, I want I want to see what happens with the uh, NBTA and buses. And mm, do I you think, think that will come to a head? I, 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 I would like to, I'm hoping that there'll be at least more activity on that in mm -hmm. council. And it would be one of the things that actually was a high that I forgot to mention too, is seeing some, some of the people who are in support of better public transit in the city, like John McLaughlin, mm -hmm. talking like you know, full-throated endorsement of mm -hmm. it. Mm -hmm. makes me hopeful that at least there may be some future like improvements whether it's bus lane or anything like that in, in our future getting something like the 70 extension would be amazing for downtown yeah. waltham like being able to get into boston and back opens up a lot for commuting but mm -hmm. with that the double-edged sword there is that it's going to create an increased demand for housing in waltham in range of that which brings us back to why aren't there why is there more happening there and i I don't want to be a downer and make yeah. the prediction that nothing's going to happen, but I have a feeling nothing's going to happen on that front next in the next session either. And it's not going to, I don't think it's anything's going to happen until people are raising hell about it. Do you guys recall any discussion about the housing choice? Um, the housing choice law, has it, has it impacts all of them? No, not in any of the meetings we saw. At some point, they're going to have to talk about that. Yeah. Um, for those who just to recap, because we talked about this in our interview back in January, uh, Christine said something it's coming up that the state has a law that uh, communities that are on the T um, have to. Uh, it's basically an up zone within a certain um, proximity to certain kinds of transit. And I, I can't quote you like, yeah, which transit and what the up zoning is. Um, but that's that's what the state law says is you need to up zone for transit and that if you don't. Uh, state grant monies will be withheld from the city. So we need to, since Waltham's on the T, within a certain distance of the T, we can't have single family only zoning unless we decide to ignore it and give up that money. See, I don't, right? I don't know if it's you can't have single family zoning or if it's you must create zoning that would allow construction of X number of units. Like oh, I haven't, got it. okay. it's been a while since I looked at it. So I can't quote you exactly what it is, but sooner or later the council is going to have to discuss that, right. or this, this, they're going to have to. As, as you were discussing it now, I do recall this did come up briefly mentioned by McMinnon, like a, a, referring to it as the decree to get rid of the suburbs. Oh, is that what oh, you're talking that, about? Then? I think that's what this was. Yes. So it yes. seemed yes. like, <laughs> based on the attitudes we've heard expressed, most likely Waltham's going to try to ignore this law and just eat the loss and money. But it's certainly an opportunity to bring up what our overall plan is for housing, um, that we're willing to sacrifice that much money for. I mean, I also, say this largely, you know, the conversation about the taking of that farmland near the new school. Yes. Ma Councillor McMenamin made it very clear that the best the reason to do it was to prevent a housing project. Yeah. And I think there have been, even though I haven't been following along, I think there have been a lot of other properties that Waltham have bought mainly for that reason. So the idea that the city would spend money just to prevent having multifamily housing somewhere is very believable. 
Yeah. And also, also, well, it also speaks to, it, it's interesting because like they make a big show of conflict of interests on city council, but then like you look at like what these people do for work and like some of them are in construction, some of them have whole families that are into landlording. Others are like in, have had personal businesses related to construction, mm -hmm. HVAC, whatever. And it's like- Real estate. It, real estate, yeah. Mm -hmm. and, and it is in their interest for housing prices to continue to go in one direction and one direction only. And it's not a coincidence that they're so like monomaniacally focused on not having more housing get built. Or if it is housing getting built, that it's high value housing. Exactly. Yeah. And, that, um, and that's gentrification. Yes. So. Also, side rant, it's stupid to say that Waltham's a suburb. Like, Waltham started as farmland, but then we were a city. We had industrial centers. Like, we're our own thing. And I think to say, like, we're only a suburb of Boston is really reductive of both the history and the reality of what Waltham is right now is that mm -hmm. we're a city and we have a diverse array of people who are already here. And to say that, like, we're going to not become a suburb anymore, like, who cares? Cities are better, and Waltham is better than that, and we deserve to have a community that is diverse, and the people who are here who need housing deserve to have housing. That's a good point, and hopefully this law will force them to have some substantive discussion about housing this year, because they have to make a decision about whether mm -hmm. we're following the law or not, right? So hopefully it'll come to a head. Yeah. Uh, something we didn't talk about, uh, and the council didn't talk about, the... Uh, the um, the committee of master plans. Oh, the master oh, plan. Yeah. Yeah. Right. That never <laughs> that never met once. I, that I, 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 I know of. I know. I know. I predict the one master plan meeting before you the year. So? Well, I mean, she. I mean, the mayor. I mean, we can we can make fun of the fact that it didn't meet, but it might be not in the mayor's plans. You could they could meet. They could meet. In, you could have planned for it to be in October, and she would have had to assign a committee in January. Yep. Um, so, you know, it's funny that they didn't meet, but they so still have six months. They the still have six reuse committee. Fernal uh, reuse committee doesn't uh, even have any, any members yeah, yet. Yeah. So, but unless she assigned them and they had a meeting we don't know about because they wrote it like on the bottom of the yeah. bulletin board mm -hmm. or something like that. Sure. Yeah, so it's like, uh, as far as we know, the city council hasn't done anything on Fernal this year, yeah. but yeah, they, have. They, well, they, they, have. Have, they haven't officially done anything on Fernal this year, but work has started. Yeah. Yes. Yeah. So, so yeah, the city's doing yeah. stuff at the site, but the city council has not talked about it publicly mm -hmm. at all. And they will have to at this meeting on August 1st. Mm -hmm. That's why I think it's six. So that be used to be a very spicy committee. Uh, yes. Back in the yes. day, yes. they yes. used to yell at each other. George Jarson and Tom Stanley used to yell at each other all really? the time. Yeah. And it hasn't met at all this session. Um, OK, I think that's more than enough footage to make this a good show. Good Thanks, awesome. Okay. Thank yeah. you very much, everyone. Thank this you. was really fun. Yeah. Thanks yeah. for inviting me to join you guys. Yeah. Okay. Thanks, everyone.